Hi there, everyone. Welcome to another Chem Complete lecture. And for today's lecture, we're going to do a little bit of problem solving. So I thought that we would take a look at how to solve a mass spectroscopy problem that you might come across in a typical undergraduate class, maybe a graduate class, and take a look at how we could potentially solve it looking at some fragmentation patterns. So this probably won't be too long, uh, but I do want to explain the process in how we can determine this. So mass spec is useful for determining compounds by their mass. So you may have seen other videos that we've done on the channel talking about the M plus peak and the base peak. Those are two separate things. So the M plus peak is going to be the peak that represents the mass of the compound you're analyzing. And then the base peak is going to be the one that has the highest relative intensity. So it usually will be probably the most stable fragment or stable ion after the compound has been bombarded with the electron energy. Okay, so one question that often comes up is what do we do if we have two different compounds but they have the same mass right so you're given two mass specs and they both have the same m plus peak and you have to differentiate between the two well at that point because they both have the same molar mass by mass spec you would need to start working on looking at some of the fragmentation patterns and usually the base peak is a good area to start so you want to find the peak that is the tallest peak in terms of the relative intensity compared to all the others because it represents one of the most stable uh, ions that have kind of fragmented from the original compound all right so let's take a look at a little case study here so here's our case study. We're going to look at methyl cyclohexane and ethyl cyclopentane. So these are structural isomers of one another in organic chemistry, and they both would have a relative mass of 98. So if we were to put both of these in the mass spec, we would find an M plus peak at 98 for each of them. So the question is, how could we properly differentiate between the two if that is the only information we knew was that these were the two compounds they're not particularly labeled on the mass specs for us and it's our job to figure out how we can determine which one is methyl cyclohexane and which is ethyl cyclopentane given that they both have the same m plus peak so i did just that i brought both of them here and you can see it's just labeled a and b so we're going to want to take a look at each of these and do some analysis determined on the base peak relative to the m plus peak so to start with the m plus peak is going to be 98 this one right here now you may notice there is a peak at 99 and technically in this one down here there's one at 100 that's what's known as the m plus one and the m plus two peaks now those peaks are the result of isomers i'm sorry isotopes Okay, so this is likely due to the fact that there is a C13 present in some of the molecules. Okay, and the M plus 2 is likely going to be the fact that there could potentially at times be two C13 molecules in one of the uh, various isomers here. That's the one that's M plus 2 down here. Okay, so that's what that is. When you, whenever you see a mass peak that's above the M plus, that's usually due to isotopes that are present there that are making a slightly heavier compound. Okay, and the chance you can see this is a lot lower. The chance is about one in a hundred that a C13 will be present in one of these molecules here. All right, so that being said, we've identified the M plus peak at 98. And now we want to take a look at the base peak. So that's the one with the highest relative intensity. So if I come over to A, I can see that 69 is the mass peak that would be considered the base peak here. And then if I come down, the relative intensity for 83, okay, is going to be the uh, highest one for B. So what I can do with this, or what this tells me, is I can take a look at, all right, what is the mass of the compound, which is 98, and then I subtract that value from the original mass. So it's going to be 98 minus 69, and in that case we get 29. So then if I go down to this second 
area for b, I find the same thing. I take 98 minus 83, and in this case I get 15. So this is important information because what this is telling me is that I had the loss of an ion or a fragment that had the mass of 15. Whereas up here, I had the loss of a fragment that had a mass of 29. That's important because 15 and 29 are two different numbers and they're going to represent two different fragments that came off. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to pull up the guide that I wrote for spectroscopy. So if you're interested in this, you can head over to chemcomplete.com. And if you go to buy guides, this guide is available. It doesn't just do mass spectroscopy. It really ties together NMR, mass spectroscopy, IR, and it tells you how you can put all those together in order to solve for different structures with worked examples. Okay, so if you're interested in that and supporting the channel, head on over to chemcomplete.com. Now, if you go to the bottom of this guide, I have an appendix for mass spectroscopy, and the appendix tells you some of the most common ion fragments. So these are ones that you should be familiar with if you're working with mass spec during a semester. Okay, and two of the most common ones are 15, which represents the ion fragment methyl, and then 29, which can represent either an aldehydic fragment from an aldehyde or ethyl. And in this case, it would be ethyl because neither of the compounds have an aldehyde present. Okay, so what that represents is that the loss of a methyl was common in one of them, and then the loss of an ethyl was common in the other. So if we go back up here and we take a look at these structures, it should be somewhat evident in terms of which one was most likely for which. We only have the presence of a methyl coming off of this ring here, and we have the presence of an ethyl coming off of the ethyl cyclopentane. So what that should mean is that A, with the mass fragment of 29 that has been removed or lost, most likely represents the ethyl cyclopentane. And then that means the opposite for B. So B is most, li most likely going to be the methyl cyclohexane. And that, again, is due to the mass fragments that were lost. So by looking at the two base peaks, which were the most two common uh, ions that were going to form, they're likely the ring structures that are left behind after we have cleaved or fragmented these smaller portions off. Now you will note that the 15 and 29 peaks are not particularly high relative to that other fragment, and that's because if we take a look at, for instance, the peak at 15, you're talking about a methyl that has a positive charge. Well, methyl cations are not particularly stable, and so they're not going to form very often. So that's the reason the peak at 15 is so low, okay? But the peak that was left behind that had a charge, 83, that is the charge of the ring after the methyl had been lost. And so that would be this right here. That's a secondary cation with the ring structure locked in. So that's going to be far more stable than the methyl, and that's the difference in the relative intensity. You're not going to see many CH3 charged ions forming, but you will see a whole bunch of the 83, which is, the again, the ring structure that's got that positive charge. And for the 69, it would be the same thing. It's the ring structure. Okay. Now, 29 is a little more prevalent just because it's a uh, primary carbocation, instead of a methyl. So you do have a better shot, still not great, of forming this cation, right, versus the methyl cation. The primary is still going to be slightly more stable than the methyl because it has a little bit of hyperconjugation property from the neighboring CH3. All right, that's it. Hopefully people found this useful and you can apply it to something that you come across either in your work or your class. Please remember to like the video. It helps to boost our work in the YouTube algorithms and get this content out to everybody. If you subscribe, you'll be up to date for your semester, and I will see everybody next time.